He's a father of the modern prayer movement. His best-selling book, 35 Years and Going, Could You Not Tarry for One Hour, uh, earned him the title by Oral Roberts as the Apostle of Prayer. He revolutionized Christian music in the, in the Midwest on television, a youth revolution. He's pastored three mega churches. Uh, you may know him as a lot of things. I know him as a dear friend, and he is the Apostle of Prayer. Welcome, Dr. Larry Lee. How you doing? Brad, I love you, man. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Love you. It's good to see you, man. <laughs> Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here at GLC, and I'm enjoying so much the fellowship of all of my friends in the yeah. Permian Basin, and particularly today, my friends over in Andrews, where I got to preach again. Oh, yeah, we Kingdom's did. Gate. Yeah, we did it. And uh, our, our friends that are, drove us over this afternoon, it's just a joy to be back in this part of God's country. And it is a wonderful day to be alive for Jesus. Oh, I tell you what, Larry, it's, it's good to see you as always. You. And, of course, we have a history. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into some of that. But so, <laughs> so thankful for Kyle, Melissa Hooper, and right. Kingdom's Gate. And so, in you know, Andrews, Texas, I mean, I'll tell you what, it's a very special town. So, it really uh, is. If you have a chance, you need to go to Andrews, Texas, to Kingdom's Gate. Yeah, you will and, enjoy and it. Visit those great people, you know. And it's always an honor to be there. Dan Galloway actually uh, uh, met you and Andrews and, and brought you in to, to Crossbar Cowboy Church with Kerry Pack and, of course, Kyle yeah. Hooper. And, and now, look at what has happened. You know, God is on the move, and He's doing some great things now. I tell you what, Larry, we're living in some interesting times, but for those who are experiencing you for the first time, uh, there's a lot of people who love you, would pray with you every morning on television, you know, and, and, and again, you know, with the intro, it's like, man, there's so many things I want to say, Larry, yeah, you know, but, but the dearest thing that you are uh, to, to my heart, just a precious friend, and I've watched you uh, in public and in private, I tell you what, uh, you're the real deal. Thank you, sir. And we need you. We need the ministry of prayer now more than ever. i tell you what the Lord has really dealt with me about recently is really getting back to real. Right. And with all the shaking that's going on in the world that we live in, we're living in a time where people are not interested in just going through the motions of churchianity. Right. They're really hungry for the real. And my ministry started... <laughs> as a result of an experience I had with the Lord Jesus. Yeah. And he became real to me. I was a very uh, traditional Southern Baptist kid. But when Jesus came into my life, I, I was a student at Dallas Baptist University. And I told this this morning. I went out, and as a student there, I knew I'd been called. I knew I'd been saved. I knew I'd been called to preach. But I was reading the Bible, and the Bible will mess up your best theologies. If you read it, <laughs> what you were raised with and what you read in that book right. are two different things. And I was reading, I said it this way, I read the red, that is the Jesus part, then I'd read the book of Acts, then I'd read all the way through the gospel, read the book of Acts, and I said, Lord, reading the red and praying for the power, one night I went out on that little mountain there at Dallas Baptist University, and I said, Lord, I want everything you have for me. Wow. I don't care what it costs me, which is a dangerous prayer, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. Because here I, I get what you pray for. Here I sit 51 years later, practically. Uh -huh. And I'm sitting here, and I was saying, Lord, I want everything you've got for me. And I don't care what it costs me. And the next thing I heard was a language coming out of my mouth that I had never learned. And I said, Lord, and I knew I'd just prayed in the Spirit. But I'd never heard anybody else do it, never been around it. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, this is going to ruin my ministry. And <laughs> he said, that's right, son, this is going to ruin your ministry. But my ministry for you is just now beginning. <laughs> yeah, and no, I, I fell under heavy conviction about wow. prayer and how prayer was, the, you know, Jesus said my house will be called the house of prayer. But I was so overwhelmed at the prayer life of Jesus. Right. And how he would rise up early in the morning and go out and pray, then pray on the mountaintop and walk on water, and then all the way through the Garden of Gethsemane, he did not get to where he got when he died for us right. on Calvary's cross by just cruising through life. He right. had to pray through to the place of grace where the Bible said, let us come boldly before the throne of grace 
for six or seven years there, I, I struggled with this call. And then finally, when uh, after we'd seen the Lord just blow up, a, uh, uh, with all due respect, a Baptist church that blew up in a good way, uh -huh, uh -huh. it went from 400 people to 5,000 people. I was a youth pastor. Right. And we, were doing, we were doing youth concerts, and they wouldn't let that music in the church back then. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But, boy, I tell you, people loved it. And they they're, still do. They're sacred songs now, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, I mean, you brought Keith Green to the oh, Midwest, Amy God. Grant, so many big names. Well, the second chapter of Act, and Andre Crouch came yeah. to Dallas for the first time to sing at our concert. Well, they, these were youth concerts that the Lord spoke to my heart and said, you've got to get this, the kids singing the gospel. And most people don't know this, but the Pope many hundreds of years ago said, I fear one of Martin Luther's songs more than 1,000 of his sermons <laughs> because the kids were wow. singing it in the streets. Wow. And that's, of course, during the Protestant Reformation some, some hundreds and hundreds of wow. years ago, but it was the same conviction. We had to get the music right. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we had an old friend named Larry Norman said, why should the devil have all the good that's music? That's right. Remember that? <laughs> I remember that, man. And, uh, and I kept saying, let's do concerts. So we began to do these things, and the kids started coming by the thousands, oh, literally. Yeah. So we were having a 5,000 a month for, I guess it went five and a half years. And wow. it pioneered what we now know as regular so-called praise and worship music. Right. That's where it was being birthed. Wow. So now, the, now, you were associated with Christ for the Nations during this time. Yes, Christ they're, they're for the Nations. They're a youth pastor it, as well, right? It was, uh, you yeah, know, I taught youth ministry, okay, as a okay, matter of okay. fact, at Christ for the Nations for a short period of time, but uh, I, I had a great relationship with all the people there, and they were enjoying watching what God was doing wow. over in this Baptist church, which became a Baptist-Costal church. I don't know how else to say no, that, that, that's, that's the correct term. I yeah, know. and we began <laughs> to see the Lord do miracles wow. uh, through the lives of so many. I'm talking about more than I could ever think could happen. Wow. And it all happened as a result of uh, a dedication to say, Lord, I don't care what it costs. Doesn't matter who likes it, doesn't like it. We were doing a concert somewhere one night, and I remember I had an old friend named Russ Taff who's still yeah. out there doing music. Oh, yeah. I love you, Russ, wherever you are. Oh, yeah, he's and still doing he's it. He's doing it, and he loves the Lord. And I remember uh, Russ, they were preparing to do the, their, their music set. Right. And the guy that was running the place, he came and said, man, they can't be playing those guitars like that in there. They can't be. <laughs> he said, what the are you The Imperials, gonna... right? Yeah, and I said, hey, just give me a chance. Give us a chance. There were 500 teenagers saved that night. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, that was the beginning of, a, of a, just a wave of music. Look swept out. all over the world. And now again, that was 40-some years ago, 35 years ago. So well, amazing. There's a... There's a cycle, a 40-year right. cycle, right. generational cycles, and we're getting back to what I just call the real, people wanting it right. to keep it real, yeah. keep it out of a, a sense of religiosity, or just a show. Right. It needs to be something that really touches the lives of people. Well, and speaking of real, uh, I mean, amazing things happen in all the ministry you've been doing, but what's even more amazing is your story. Yeah. You know, when, when you, you, such a radical conversion uh, that really took to the point that it just rocked your world. You want yeah. to touch on that for those who are watching? Because, you know, some of you are watching right now that you, you don't have a faith background or maybe you don't have a church background. Hey, that's all right. You know what? It's never been a better time to approach Jesus right now. That's Where right. you are, forget all the religion you've ever heard, but it's time that you hear real stories. And that's how we overcome, uh, by, by the blood of the Lamb, the Word, word of our, our testimony, testimony. And part That's of your right. testimony, inspired me as a, as a young teenager. It's an amazing thing, Brant, that as a 17-year-old kid, 1968, uh, I had come to the place in my own spiritual life, or my own life, yeah. where I just literally, I had everything and had nothing. I don't know if you've ever known yeah. anybody that had everything and had yeah. nothing at the same yeah. time. Uh, my dad was a very, very successful businessman. Uh, we were living in high cotton in East Texas uh -huh, oil field. Uh -huh. 
down in Kilgore, Texas, and I tried to tell my parents that I'm empty. Something's missing. And I kept saying it long enough that they finally said, well, we're going to have to get you an examination because, man, I'll never forget my dad saying, Everybody, anybody's got everything you got and you're not happy. What's wrong with you? Right, right. And I said, well, I don't know. Something's missing. And I remember I went down front of my first Baptist church that I grew up in, and I told the pastor, I said, Pastor, I don't know what's wrong. I just need something in my life that I don't have. Well, I didn't know the Lord at that yeah, time. Yeah. I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know him. Right. And he said, well, Larry, you're a good boy. Just sit down here on the front row, and we're going to give you a thing to fill out, a little form to fill out. And I, I, as I was sitting there filling that out, I knew that that was not what I needed. Right. And my parents took me to a, a, a center, a hospital, to have me checked out. And I kept telling them, there's something missing. I don't know what it is. They put me into the hospital, and there in the hospital, they started, I'll never forget, the, the doctor walked in and says, what's wrong? And I said, I really don't know, except I know something's missing. What is it, doc? And that doctor, God bless him, he did the best he could. But they brought me four pills that hour, and four pills four hours later, wow. and four pills four hours later. And by the second day I was there, I didn't know who I was, where I was, uh -huh. what planet I was on. Right. But all I knew is that somehow it had to be the Holy Spirit because no one was there talking to me. Right. Nobody was there asking me what's, you know, or telling me the gospel. Right. And I remember I laid a white sheet down on the floor, and I laid on the floor, and I began to say, Jesus, Jesus. This is the way I prayed. I, you know, I've said it often, a man in a burning building does not pray a religious prayer. No, he didn't. He doesn't pray, <laughs> oh, thou most high God, I know you're there. Nothing religious about it. I was crying out for mercy. Lord Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And as I was calling on his name, I heard a voice as real as your voice to me today. Speaking in my spirit, he said to me, you will be a minister to young people. You will be a minister to young people. And I said to the Lord, I said, I said, Lord, what does this mean? And I realized at that moment that my life had meaning. My life had purpose. And I look back now and I say, I realized I was being converted. I, I mean, Jesus was real to me. And the doctor came in the next day and he said, how are you doing today? I said, I'm a lot better today. He said, why? I said, because I talked to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> he said, everybody in here talks to Jesus sooner or later. <laughs> but but uh, it was funny uh, that we're carrying a, I remember I, I, I was going through the Catholic hospital. It was a Catholic hospital. I was gathering up the crosses because they had in Latin, <laughs> yeah. in read. This I remember is, this. This is the first chapter of Could You Not Tarry at One Hour, by the way, the book on prayer uh -huh. that I wrote uh -huh. later that, that has been out there for 35 years or more. Wow. And I was... I thought they were making fun of Jesus. I thought they were calling him Henry. <laughs> now, Henry in Latin means Christ. Right, right. And, and right. I was gathering up, and there were, I was walking through the hospital carrying all these crosses. <laughs> they were chasing me through the hospital, and I was screaming, his name is not Henry. His name is Jesus. Now, I know that may be funny to you, but at the time, I was serious about it. Wow. A 17-year-old kid found Jesus in a hospital. Wow. And within a year, I was preaching the gospel. Yep, yep. I started preaching the next year yep. and telling people that this wasn't about religion. Right. This was not a religious experience or it wasn't something they needed to go through just to punch the clock right. on Sundays and sometimes right. on Wednesdays. But they needed to know Jesus. Yeah. And I could not escape it. I, I, uh, <laughs> I remember telling my... A friend of mine that was attending church who came to hear me preach, we were talking about him today, who's been in the ministry as long as I have. Right, right. Named Jerry Howell. Oh, yeah. And I, he came up to me. He was a Key, long, keyboard, keyboardist for a, 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 a band Mouse called Trap. Mouse and the Traps. Mouse and the Traps, that's right. Uh, uh, Mouse was the singer, uh -huh. and Jerry was one of the Traps. Uh -huh. okay, he, uh -huh. was a, he was a B3 organ player. Boy, he could rock that thing. He could do it and still can, and it's amazing <laughs> He came up to me and said, Larry, he said, 
I've been coming to church for six months since my dad passed away. That's the first time I've heard anything that made any sense at all to me. Wow. What you said tonight. I remember what I preached that night some 40, I guess, almost 50 years ago. Wow. I preached the dove and the lamb. Uh, that when Jesus, the Lamb of God, came out of the water, the dove came and let, let down upon him. And you know, a, 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 a lamb would not allow a barking dog or a fighting lamb, but a dove so gentle. And I was preaching about the dove and the lamb. I don't wow. know where I got the message. <laughs> From reading but the Bible, I was reading it. He came up and said, man, tell me about Jesus. And that Friday night, I, picked, I was becoming a youth pastor of a church down the road. And I said, Jerry, come and go with me. And he got up on that, that big organ in that big Baptist church, oh, and he man. played Amazing Grace in a way it never been played before. <laughs> <laughs> with his long blonde hair down past his shoulders, <laughs> driving this hippie van that all the mothers and daddies in town said, don't get in that hippie van. <laughs> this really happened. And uh, that night, we got back to his house about midnight. He said, tell mm -hmm. me about Jesus. And I started preaching about midnight. And he stopped me at about 3 in the morning. He said, now you can stop. I got it. I got it. I've got to make an exchange you, you preach here. like the Apostle Paul. He said, hey, i got to make a, you're telling me i got to make an exchange right. of my life for the life of Jesus. Uh -huh. There's got to be a transfer of authority. Yeah. He's got to be Lord of all. Mm -hmm. And he's, I said, that's it, Jerry. Well, I got home, it was 5 o'clock in the morning, my phone rings, and Jerry said, Larry, I went in and I did what you told me to do, because I told him, I said, well, here's how you get it. You go read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh -huh. I knew that was safe because I'd read that in the Bible. Uh -huh. Matthew 5, <laughs> 6, and 7, you start calling out on the name of Jesus. And I said, Jerry, when it hits you, you know you got it. That's what I told him. <laughs> and he called me a couple hours later. And he said, Larry, I got it. Yeah. But I've been down to my friend Max's house, and Max was out in the backyard feeding his rabbits. He said, Mouse was the drummer. Uh -huh. He was another one of the traps. He said, you know how weird Max is. You better go over here. <laughs> you better check Max out because he's far out. You know how far Max is. So anyway, that started a youth revival in our hometown. Wow. 1969, 1970, right yeah. in there. And it's been going on ever since. Oh, yeah. And it's still happening. And it's replicated all over the world. It is. It's now, it's, it's a youth movement that the devil cannot do no, anything no, about. There's no. nothing can stop what's going on. And as I preached this morning from Haggai chapter uh, 2 and verse 9, the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. And that latter house, that last house, greater than that of the former. We know the Bible, they were referencing back to Solomon's temple. Right. When Solomon finished his praying after the great temple, the most beautiful, magnificent temple that had ever been built, the fire came from heaven and it consumed what was on the altar and then the glory came so great that people could not stand, the priests could not stand to minister because of the glory yeah. of God. Wow. And when I, when I read that recently, that book right there in Haggai, it said the glory of the latter house, the last house, I realize that the shakings that are going on in the world right now, the things that are happening right now in our world are bringing forth a church that's going to be earmarked as a house of prayer. Wow. And so God has been dealing with me so strongly to go preach it, and I've been going everywhere I can. And we're going all over the place. Yeah. And uh, this is what we've been doing. Since we birthed the church, uh, I was a youth pastor after Jerry got saved. I became youth pastor of a progressive Southern Baptist church. Uh -huh. that's, when the, that's when the concert started. Right. That ran for seven years. And our pastor got sick suddenly, and he passed away. I was with him as close as I am to you right now when yeah. he passed. And I felt something come down on my shoulders. I thought somebody put a sheet over me or something. I reached to remove it, and there was nothing there. And I realized a mantle had come upon me. I didn't know what it was. And when they offered me to be the pastor of that 
member of the Wow, Church. and how old were you then? I was 28 years old. Oh, wow. I was graduating wow. from seminary. Right, I'd right. gone through Dallas Baptist University, Southern, <clears throat> Southwestern right. Baptist Theological Seminary, graduating with my Master's of Divinity. They asked me to be the pastor. And I'll never forget what the guy said. He said, Larry, if you'll just play your cards right with us, and he was talking about the deacon board, and do what we tell you to do. We'll make you rich and we'll make you famous. And I told the guy, I said, sir, I'd be fine, but I quit playing cards when I got saved. And I'm not going to play cards with you guys. I said, no, I believe in elders. Yeah. I believe in a, a council of elders around a, a, a senior leader. I said, and I'll do that. And they said, well, we don't want a, a youth church here. We don't want yeah. young people running our church. I've heard that. And I had been... <laughs> I had been in Israel. I'd, t I'd sold my hippie. Va I had a beautiful hippie van myself. Of, Dang. And I sold it, so I get an airline ticket to go pray with an old prophet in Israel. Wow. And I prayed for seven days that, that my pastor would not die and that our church would live. Right. I come home. After that prayer time, the Lord said, the pastor is going to come to be with me now. And he said, that church is going to refuse you. When I told the man I wasn't going to play cards with them, I wasn't going to do it according to right. the standard way that the Baptist church is run. I said, I can't do that. When I said those words, he said these words to me. He said, you have been refused by us. We refuse you. The same words I heard when I was in Israel praying with a great prophet who's now with God. Wow. A prophet in Israel, well regarded in Israel. So the Lord set it up, and I went back home, of all things, back to Kilgore, Texas. Now, I had been youth pastor of a 5,000-member church. Uh -huh. We were ministering to 5,000-plus kids, being broadcast on all three Christian networks. Yeah. God was doing it. It was all God, and I find myself back home sleeping in the same bed I slept in the night I graduated from high school. Wow. And I said, Lord, what is going on here? And I met a man who was getting up early to pray, and he wanted me to preach a three-week revival, and they'd gone through 21 days right. of 24-hour prayer. Wow. Somebody every hour on the hour was praying. That sounds familiar. It was powerful. And when the revival hit, a young all-American from uh, Tatum High School, a little East Texas town. He got saved. His name was uh, Galen Haygood. And I'll never forget that he was a linebacker. Uh. He went and told his whole football team, I met this young preacher, and here came the whole football team the next week, and they all got saved. <laughs> then all the cheerleaders got saved. <laughs> then great. all the coaches got saved. <laughs> and then it seemed like all of East Texas was attending. Wow. And it was an incredible move of God. The revival lasted seven weeks. And I stayed there 18 months, getting out of bed, going to prayer at 5 a.m. in the morning wow. with the pastor, the senior pastor. His name is B.J. Wilhite. Still alive today. Met him one Still day, yeah. praying. Uh -huh. Unbelievable man of God. And during those weeks, the revelation that we preached in the book, Could You Not Tarry One right, Hour? Right, right. Birth, what is happening still today, and particularly the revival that happened in a little town called Rockwall, Texas, oh, where you've gosh. been many times. Oh, yeah. And it was something to behold. God did it. Well, you know... There's, there's video of you talking about how God built my church, is what yeah, you said. Yeah, right. But Rockwall, that's a fascinating story because, I mean, you know, I mean, it's an incredible town now, but there was more people in the church than there was in the town. That's right. We, you know? we birthed the church out of a home group that wanted to get a prayer movement started. Yeah. Now, this is really, again, recycling, getting back to what's real. Yeah. And so I agreed to go on Saturday nights and lead this prayer meeting, Brand, and we started in the home. We outgrew the home. We got to a place there was 100 people trying to get in the living room of the house. It wasn't working. Right. So I had a decision to make, and I was, in, I was actually in Canada preaching, and the Lord said, go to Rockwall and establish my people there. It's interesting. He never said build a church there. He said establish my people there. Huh. 
It was as though he was saying, I'm going to give you a pulpit from this place to preach this message. And that's what I knew in my knower for the whole 11 following years because wow. within a year, the church had grown to 800 people, and we went through our trials. I'll tell you the truth. I went through some tremendous opposition from the city fathers all the way to some of our own groups put off and tried to uh, take us down. But uh, during that time, I remember uh, I had a group of the guys come over to my house, and I referenced back to a previous thing I just said. They said, now look, you can't get up and say the Lord's speaking to you anymore because uh -huh. then we can't say anything about it. You've got to come ask us what you think the Lord is saying, and then if we agree, we'll let you preach that. Now, these were the men with about 800 people that had been added, seemed like overnight, within a year and a half, two years. Uh -huh. And these were the people that were underwriting the church. These were the people that had the money uh -huh. that was paying for us now meeting in the yeah. cafetorium. And it was, they said, well, what would you do if we took our money and left here? Uh -huh. And I said, well, if you took your money and left and this church died, You'd be doing me the greatest favor that anybody ever did because if it's living, <laughs> if this church is living on your money, it's already dead while it's alive. That's right. Well, the next Sunday, they were all on the front row for the first time. Oh, we're, we're, we're okay. And, and I was driving up in my little yellow Volkswagen Rabbit, and uh -huh. the Lord said, You're not going to get to preach today. I said, Oh, it's going to be a Hallelujah Sunday. It was not a Hallelujah Sunday. <laughs> One of them got up and took the microphone away from me and said, we advise all of you uh -huh. to do what we're about to do right now. And they, all seven families got up and walked out. Oh, yeah. And I got, I got the microphone back and I said, we, somebody here is taking their eyes off of Jesus. Yeah. Let's put our eyes back on the Lord. We sang a couple songs. Everybody was in shock. And we left. The next week, I'll be very honest with you, I got low. I went low. It uh, hurt, uh, man. That, yeah. It hurts. Yeah. And I said, Lord, this hurts. And yeah. I was quickened to go out to a place where I'd pray out in the woods. I laid on the ground. I'll never forget. I could feel the leaves crushing into my face as I was laying there. I said, Lord, what am I going to do? And then he spoke these words to me. Those that are with you can't leave you. Uh -huh. And those that are not with you can't stay. So the next Sunday, I preached what I call the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not sweat it. <laughs> We're not going to worry about it. We ain't going to worry about it. And so I just went, wow, preaching the Word of God. And before I knew what happened, our group that grew from 800 to 400 after that split, uh -huh. we went from 400. After that, we started adding 20, 30, 50. We were able to build, uh, we were able to buy land by a miracle. Right through a cowboy that came to church, and I uh -huh. think you've heard that story. Well, I, I, wanted, I wanted to segue into that because not only did you get rid of a problem, yeah, and you know, you know, I, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, I, I've got to plan a few churches, and it's so beautiful, but it's only a matter of time till someone comes in, and you have to make it clear, no secrets. Right. You know, everyone can have their say, but not everyone can have their way. And when people try to own you, that's it. That's when it begins to die unless you confront it. Unless you stand and there. And you did. I say it uh, yeah. this way, that manifestation always brings confrontation. Wow. Uh, you remember the, the man that was let down through the roof where Jesus was teaching and there was no room to receive him about the door. And it, the word got out, Jesus was in the house. Yeah. That was one of my favorite sayings all through the years. When it's noise abroad, Jesus is in the house. Uh -huh. Then the people will come. Yeah. Who's here? Don't talk about me. Talk about him. Right. Tell them Jesus. Is, well, when they let the man down, Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Yeah. And you remember the confrontation came. Who, can, who does this guy think he is that he can forgive sins? Jesus was the only one who could, and right. he did. Right. But then he says, So that you will believe that the Son of Man, Jesus said these words. Right. So you believe that I, the Son of Man, have the power to forgive sins. I say to this man, sick of the palsy and lame, could not walk, and had all kind of physical difficulties. The Bible says when he saw their faith, there were four men that let him down. But it wasn't, it wasn't just the four, it was five. That fifth man laying on that pallet had to have faith too. Right. 
He said, so I say to you, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he got walked. Well, from that little revelation, I realized anytime there's a manifestation of the power of God, there will be a confrontation right. from the religious group. Oh, yeah, always. The religious spirits will always rise up right. when there's the manifestations right. of power and glory. When that happens, it always happens supernaturally. Well, I got a call one night after the church was up again. We were well over a 1,000 people, so we had to get land. Right. We had to buy land. Right. And we, and so I said, where's the land, Lord? And I drove my Volkswagen Rabbit out over the <laughs> hot Land point. back in there, Rabbit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We had 5,000 people in town. We had 1,000 people going to church at that time. And I drove that little Volkswagen Rabbit over a, a plot of ground. And I said, Lord, I want this ground right here. And the next day I went out there and somebody put on a, literally a stick sign, said for sale and a telephone number. Uh-huh. And I called the number, and the guy said, look, my dad deeded me these 50 acres. It's very wealthy. It's right on the Interstate 30. And he said to me, he said, uh, I said, well, how much do you want for it? And he told me it was an astronomical number. Right, right. Something I could not get my brain wrapped around. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, he said uh, preacher, he said, do you really believe God told you you're supposed to have? I said, yeah, I do, but I need about three or four, maybe five weeks to get that money together. Over those five weeks, he had three cash offers, and he turned them all down. Wow. He said, I'm a backslidden Church of Christ deacon. Uh -huh. But when I called him and told him the story uh -huh. of the cowboy uh -huh. who came in the back door after I'd been warned by the law, this guy starts fights on Saturday night, uh -huh. and it takes a squad car full of police to wrestle him down because he was a rodeo rider <laughs> for a living. He was a professional uh -huh. Uh -huh. rodeo man. Funny story. He, he, he didn't like preachers either, did he? No. The bad thing was he had a bad experience in church, and he took it out on preachers. And they <laughs> told me, the police told me, he's going to come for you. He, he You're the you. biggest he, thing he, in town. He's trying to knock you out. They're gonna, he's going to come and beat you after death. <laughs> and I remember when he walked in the back room of the church, I knew who he was when I saw him. I'd say, everybody stand up, he'd sit down. I'd say, everybody sit down, he'd stand up. And he had that, he had that look on his the face. Tough cowboy. He, you knew what he was up to. Oh, yeah. And on a, on a Wednesday night after church, he'd laid for me. And I walked out. And as I was walking out, he jumped out from behind a, a, one of those pillars there at the high school where we were meeting. He said, Preacher, you want to go out to the truck with me? And our, on my way out to the truck, I've said it many times, I saw my life passing in front of me. I said, I've been out to the truck with some good old boys like you before and never turned out right for me. I said, I said man, I'm a preacher and a lover. I'm not a fighter, but I ain't a coward. So I'll go out to the truck with you. So I went out to the truck. He took this work boot, Brant, and he thrust it into my chest. And he said, well, there it is, because I figured something out about you. You're either straight from heaven or you're straight from hell. Uh -huh. But you ain't anywhere in between. <laughs> and he said, what I've been mad about all these years is I've been looking for a real, the real thing. Yeah. I've been looking for, yeah. and you're real. Yeah. And I looked down that workbook and I said, what is this? And my voice cracked. I remember I tried to be macho, but I wasn't. <laughs> and I said, what is in there? I remember my voice cracked. He said, that's my tithe. Because from a little boy, I've been putting my tithe in my work boot wow. since I was a young man. And particularly on the rodeo circuit, I put my tithe in my work boot. And there it was, $1,650-something. And I got up the next so Sunday as he was walking down the aisle because I took the boot into church. And I dropped that boot down on the altar, and I told this story. I was not receiving an offering. Uh -huh. Before God, I said nothing about if you want to give something to No, nothing like that. I just put it on the altar and said, look, isn't it wonderful? My friend Dwayne is getting saved. He gave his life to Jesus that day. It was beautiful. <laughs> Everybody was crying. But then people started walking up and putting money in that boot. Yeah. And we built that. We were able in five weeks. Now, listen. We were able to get the money to purchase that property out the high point in Rockwall County, which is the smallest county in the state of Texas. Right. 
and one of the wealthiest oh, counties yeah. oh, in yeah. the state of Texas oh, yeah. now because of what has happened there since this church was yeah. raised yeah. up. Yeah. And we bought the 50 acres of land, built our first building, and before I knew what was happening, teaching this revelation on prayer. Right. I had the revelation and I was doing it, but I didn't teach, I didn't write it down. I never made it into a book or anything like that. I wanted to make sure it worked. I yeah. wanted to make sure it was real in right. the people's lives. And we saw God begin to draw people from the north, south, east, and west yeah. in such a supernatural way. Oh, my, Brent. We'd look up our auditorium, the first auditorium we built. We paid cash for it out of the boot, not out of the bank. Wow. The Lord did it. The same way I just kept that boot. I knew what to do with that boot, keep it on the altar. <laughs> and people kept coming up and putting money in that boot. And we built our first building completely cash, completely debt free. Wow. And wow. there we were. And we were having having to in a thousand seat auditorium now, we were having five services on Sunday. I had a service at six AM, one at eight AM, right. one at ten AM, wow. one at noon, and one at five thirty in the afternoon. And we were having to have three midweek services, not because we we're trying to be secret sensitive. No, it's because we couldn't get them all in the building. Yeah, yeah. It was a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's a big building. Oh, it, at a uh, thousand seats with I mean, an overflow room, with right. 250 that was packed out too. So it went all day on Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And, and then God began to do miracles with this revelation that he gave me about prayer. Because I had absolutely nothing to do other than preach it one day yeah. at Brother Copeland's Believers Convention. Uh -huh. He and I at that time had become board members at Oral Roberts University. Uh -huh. And Brother Copeland invited me to come and preach this prayer message. Yeah. Because he heard about it. Right. And we'd put it in a great big blue binder with seven cassette tapes back in the day. That's uh -huh. how we communicated. And uh, Brother Copeland said, come and preach it at the Believers Convention. And from that point, miracles started happening wow. because there was a connector person. Yeah. There's always going to be a connector person. Uh -huh. Somebody that gets you from here to there will be a person of influence. Uh -huh. And God did that through Brother Copeland. And as a result, I got to know Brother Roberts personally. And that's a whole nother story. That's a whole other thing, man. Man, it was an amazing thing. Uh, I, I was preaching it at Victory Christian Center after that on a snowy, frozen roads. I'm telling people couldn't get to the meeting, but they did. And oh. 3,000 of them showed up in the middle of black ice being told to stay off the road. 3,000 people came to hear this teaching. Wow. And Brother Roberts came in, and I was praying. I was down on the floor praying, Brant. And I remember somebody walking up on me, but I didn't know who it was. And I looked up, and there stood Oral Roberts. And Brother Roberts was a tall man. Uh -huh. He was probably 6'5". And I was looking straight up at Oral Roberts, and he said, Hi, my name is Oral Roberts. I reached <laughs> up my hand, and I said, I know. That's all I can say. I know. I know. And then he said, I've listened to all seven of your teachings yeah. seven times. I've listened to your teaching wow. in the last few weeks uh -huh. since you preached at Brother Copeland's. I've listened to you preach 49 hours. And I wanted to come see what you look like. I wanted <laughs> to come see what you sounded like. And so my butterflies, I uh, usually get a little, you know, all preachers will feel that right before they get up. I say it this way, my butterflies became buzzards. I mean, I'm talking about, <laughs> here was Oral Roberts. Yeah. The apostle of faith right. that built the great university that was dedicated right. to the Lord by Billy Graham himself. Yeah. There he was sitting on the front row, and that was the night he stood up, and I never called myself anything but a servant of God. Right, right. And put his great big hand on me, that big right hand. Right, right. And he said, This is an apostle of prayer. Yeah. As long as he lives in his body, he'll preach this prayer message. And uh, that message then went all over the world oh, yeah. as the three networks came together and they simulcasted us in our new auditorium, which was 197,000 square feet under roof, sitting right out there on the freeway. And it all started with some people getting real yeah. in a home meeting. Right. Hungry. They cherished prayer yeah. more than they cherished anything else. 
And that birthed a revival that is still going on today all over the world. Without a doubt. It's hard to find someone that doesn't know your book. Yeah. I know you. You know, I yeah. mean, uh, my friend, dear friend, Alfonso Wiener, who I, I hope you'll see on GLC. Um, uh, Alphonse, we call each other our twin brothers. I call him my twin brother. He, he's as black, black as this jacket. And he's proud of it. Uh, warrior, beautiful brother, you know, yeah. beautiful family in Oklahoma City. Uh, at Covenant, and, and uh, uh, but he loves you, and wow. so many others. Uh, uh, in Kenya, he would he and other pastors being trained right. for the ministry would watch your series. Perfect. I mean, you have a lot of series out there, not just could you not tear him, man on fire, and yeah. the weapons of our warfare, and the hearing ear, and the hearing ear, All and of, of course your teachings. sayings. I mean, you know, they, in regards to forgiveness, you know, don't nurse it. Don't rehearse it. Yeah, what was no, that again? Don't nurse it. Don't don't curse it first. Don't curse it. Now, that's the first thing. Whenever you get offended, and everybody <laughs> does, I call it God's holy sandpaper. <laughs> He's coming to sand off your rough uh -huh. edges. And Jesus, when he gave the prayer that teaches us how to pray, which is the outline of prayer, and I don't know how much time we've got here, Brant, but I just want to, I just want right to say that as, as he began to give that outline, that revelation began back there years before. As I was praying one day, I saw the Lord in a vision put his, put a, uh, had a big basin in his hand, and he poured out the contents of the basin, and it was the blood. And when the blood hit the altar of God, it began to speak. And I forgot, I mean, I... As I said, I've been to Baptist University studying the Bible, double major in Greek. I'd studied all the way through it in seminary, earned a doctor's degree, right. all of that. And I did not remember where it says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, 23, and 24, the blood speaks better things than that of Abel. The blood is speaking. Every The life is in the blood. So when a man sheds his blood, particularly in death, right. his blood will speak for something. And whereas in the text, he speaks better things than that of Abel when Cain killed his brother Abel, that was a, a blood screaming out for judgment, right. justice. But when the blood of Jesus hit the altar, it was not speaking for justice, it was speaking for mercy. Yeah. And I like to say it better, it was speaking for entrance. Because it said we enter the Holy of Holies not by, not by how hard we pray or how sincere we might appear, but we come into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. And the blood was speaking the compound names of God from the Old Testament, which are all comprehended in the name of Jesus. We know some of those names. We know Jehovah Jireh. We know Jehovah Rapha. I was hearing all those compound names coming off that altar, and before I knew what I was doing, I was worshiping God. Wow. And that's how the revelation was birthed in me. It wasn't birthed by study. It wasn't birthed because I got smart and wrote a book. It had nothing to do with it. It's when I was willing to get up and go and say, Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. And he gave me the revelation. And, and uh, I'll never forget, uh, I was on an elevator one night with a man who started thumping me on the shoulder. He was a very famous preacher, and he was a big guy. He said to me, he said, I don't need your prayer teaching. And I said back to him, I said, well, brother, I just, I love you, brother, but let me just tell you, people smarter than Jesus make me nervous. That's what I told him. I said, man, people smarter than Jesus make me nervous. Said, I didn't say pray this way. Right. When Jesus gave the outline, he was saying after this manner, this is how you pray. I always thought growing up that was the Catholic's prayer of penance or that was the Protestant's prayer that we prayed at weddings and funerals. I didn't know what it was. You didn't know that when he said, when you pray. Say, yeah. and this is your outline. And all my professors through seminary and through graduate school, they all would give an outline, and they'd come back and teach what was under that outline. Well, can I just submit to you today that when Jesus gave the outline of prayer, he said nothing about the filling in the blanks, but he gave us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit fills in the blanks for us as we pray through that prayer. We can be glad. Aren't you glad today that God is your Father? 
Well, he didn't be, you didn't become a child of God right. by silver or gold or some religious right. ritual. You, you became a child of God because you were bought with the blood of the Lamb to come out of the family of Satan into the family of God. Right, right. And so the result of that was just a remarkable revelation. And it goes line by line. Hallowed be your name. And I think about all those compound names of God. The Lord our righteousness. The Lord our sanctifier. The Lord our peace. The Lord present with us. The Lord our healer, protector, provider. They go, I could go on and on. Shepherd. These are all names of experiences that people had with God in the Old Testament. And they would name the place or the experience after Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh, Abraham said, when the Lord prepared the goat coming up. Right or the ram coming up on the other side of the mountain where he was going up to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Right. An amazing revelation. Well, Jesus gave us that outline. And we were talking a moment ago to come back to your, come back to your, when you get to the place that you declare nothing but the kingdom come, right. and nothing but the will of God be done. And I'll share more about that on another day. Then it says, Give us this day our daily bread, right. and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Right. I saw the walls of Jerusalem here behind me, where I've been privileged to visit the city of Jerusalem 17 times in wow. my life and wow. preach there in wow. the largest auditoriums in Israel. This message I'm sharing with you right now, visited at midnight by rabbis that would come and say, we've never heard anything like that before. This is how Yeshua... Jesus taught prayer. And again, the last verse of the book of Matthew says so clearly, it said, teaching them to observe what I commanded you. And he didn't command them once, Brant. He commanded them at the beginning of his ministry, Matthew 6, right. at the end of his ministry in Luke 11, and he gave them the very same outline. Well, when it comes to this matter of forgiveness, I've often asked the question, and it's a message I love to preach, what was the most important part of the teaching? And we know the fatherhood of God is important. Right. We know the kingdom of God is important. We know the prosperity that we all need is important. We know the deliverance from evil is important. Right. But Jesus finished the prayer, Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. And it was like this. It was like he finished the teaching. And it's like he stopped for a moment. I just saw a pause in the spirit. And he said, now, well, wait a minute. If you forgive, you will be forgiven. But if you choose not to forgive, you'll not be forgiven. It was the only part of the prayer that teaches us how to pray. That prayer outline that Jesus gave, his prayer outline, that was the only part that he repeated. Now, think about it with me for a moment. I've often said that's how you keep an open heaven. Wow. And a closed hell. <laughs> that's how you keep the heaven open. And, and the little, the little uh, rhyme that I've used, which has been said all over the world by many people now. Uh -huh. When you go through times that you need to forgive somebody, right. you can't do it in your flesh. You must do it by the Spirit in the name of Jesus. And I challenge you, if you've got somebody that's hard for you to forgive, this is what I like to say. Don't curse it because God knew it was going to happen before it came. Don't nurse it because nobody likes somebody sitting around feeling sorry for themselves all the time. Don't rehearse it because the more you talk about it, the bigger it gets, and you'll for sure <laughs> embellish it. But disperse it. That word means release it to God. Give it to God. And if you, re if you disperse it, the promise is he will reverse it. Wow. What things were meant evil, what you meant evil against me, Joseph said in Genesis 50, talking to his own brothers when yeah. they sold him out. Right. What you meant evil against me, God has now worked together for good. Wow. And what a word that is. If you decide not to curse it because God knew it was coming, if you decide not to re nurse it and feel sorry for yourself, not to rehearse it, but to disperse it, God has given a promise he will reverse it. And everything that the world is going on right now, I'll just say right now, yeah. we've got to be full of the love of God. We've got to be filled with the forgiveness of God. 
because the craziness that's going on everywhere right now right. is bent on turning the church and, to, and, and, and God's people into a confused, angry mob, a divided right. mob. And right. in reality, we're called in the name of Jesus to release and disperse those saints to God because he's the only one that can fix them. That's right. And he's the only one who knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. Well, you know, brother, people need to download your prayer guide. And so they've been seeing the website the entire time at the bottom of the screen. Good. Download that prayer guide. It's free, free download. But it's, it, it's the prayer guide that's the overview. It seemed like yesterday that I met you. Uh, it was 2007. Wow. And we did that. Remember we did that video? Yeah. And you did the overview of the Lord's Prayer. Right. Thousands of people have watched that. Yes. You know, and, and, and so for those who are watching for the first time, you know, this is a time where God, he's, he's taken the people. He always does this. He takes the people that sometimes others don't want. Right. And he turns them into the people that everybody wants. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we had an earlier interview and talked about when you come to Jesus, you don't quit dancing. You just change partners. You know, Good. and so a lot of you are being drawn to the Lord right now. You're not from the church world, but you're hungry. You know, there's more, you know, some call them red pillars. You know, you don't fall for what you're seeing on the media. It's a good thing that you don't. That's why networks like this right. are one of the only of its kind, not censored, uh, where you can turn off the lies and turn on the truth. And so you're hungry. It's not, it's not a, a coincidence that you're watching right now. You know, I remember times in my travels, Larry, I'd, I'd turn on the television in this region, sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep, and GLC was on. Right. I needed some encouragement. And some of you are there right now. You know, the, the world is in a desperate place. But when the, when the world is the darkest, the light becomes the brightest. And there is hope. There is hope in Jesus. And you can call upon Jesus. And for those of you who are hungry, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You, you want to know how to pray. Well, would you go into your overview with the time we have? Oh, and, and my Lord's Prayer. It's such an amazing thing. I, I use a alliteration. The paternal part of the prayer is the, our Father. He, everybody needs a Father. There's the paternal part. Then there's the presence part, entering the gates with thanksgiving because of the blood. The presence part. Then there's the priority part. He is the priority. Come, kingdom of God. Be done, will of God, earth as it is in heaven. Then there's the prosperity part, where he promised to give us this day our daily bread. And by the way, he's still an excellent bread maker. And then there's the pardon part of the prayer that I've mentioned just a moment ago. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then there's the praising part where we go out and praise thine is the kingdom we come in and praise we go out and worship <laughs> thine is the kingdom power and glory forever and ever and then the amen means it shall be done that means all day long it'll keep happening as long as i'll keep praising i'll run through it one more time the paternal part the presence part the priority part the prosperity part the pardon part then the power part, delivering you from the evil one, and then the worshiping and praise part. And as long as you follow that outline that Jesus gave, nothing can stop you in your life. Jesus will be there. And can I challenge you and charge you, seek him first thing in the morning and see what happens. You know, Larry, you know that first thing in the morning better than anybody that I know of. I've watched you. I've, every place you've gone, every church that you've gone, it's amazing, and release the prayer anointing. You know, it's not easy, is it, Kyle? You get up that early in the morning. No. But when they do, I saw I saw a church explode with my own eyes when they would begin to pray. Yeah. You know, and the opposite happens when you stop. That's right. But you've done it time and time and time again, even when, <laughs> and and this didn't happen there, but even when pastors would say. Wait a minute, this thing's exploding, our church is booming, you know, and it's not just a, a, a growth for growth's sake. Right. There's, a, there's, there's literally over and over again people coming to Jesus for the first time. They're being drawn. You know what? God's a gentleman. He doesn't stay where he's not welcome. But when you pray, and when yeah. my people pray, he says, 
amazing things happen. And I've seen you, Larry, through the years. Mm -hmm. You've done it all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the same story. You'll go, you'll go into a church, release the prayer anointing, the, it explodes. Right. And they have a choice. They have a choice. They can continue or they can stop. I tell you what, folks, on a personal level, download that free prayer guide. And, and, and as far as if you're a pastor of a church, you're trying, hey, hey what, what, what do we do? What do we do? You know, during COVID was a big telltale yes, it was. for the world. Some churches had nothing to say. They had nothing to say. Nothing man. to say. You right. may be watching. You may be one of those people. Man, hey, my church didn't even call me. They didn't even care. They had nothing to say. But some of them had something to say. They stood steadfast. They stood on the name of Jesus and they prayed. They showed courage in the midst of fear. And I, I dare you, I dare you to download that prayer guide. And I tell you what, I would encourage any pastor watching, you want to release the prayer anointing in your church. And you didn't ask me to do this, but I'm going Please. to do it. Oh, you want to release that in your church? You, you better get a hold of this brother. I tell you, because he still has a whole lot to do and you're still doing it. I am. But it's amazing to me to see what happens when people pray. Go figure. You know, I love how you would talk about the names of God. I never heard about all those names. And I know we only have a, a couple of minutes left, Larry, but, but for many people, they never heard those names of Jehovah no. until they got, uh, could you not tarry for one hour? And of course, there's so many other things that you've written too, but could you do a run through real quick just for me of the different names as oh, yeah. you were exploring that and, and his role? But again, that? this came again, not just by study. I right. studied all this in, in seminary. Right. But it never came alive until that blood at the altar began to speak those names. And it came like this. Jehovah Sidkenu means the Lord, my righteous. Yes. Jehovah Mekedis, the Lord, my sanctifier, the one sanctifying me for sacred service. Jehovah Shalom, which we all know, the Lord, my peace. Yeah. Jehovah Shammah, interestingly, given at the end of Ezekiel when the whole country had been decimated. Right by the enemy. He says, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is still here. Yeah. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Wow. Jehovah Jireh, the word Jireh is a Hebrew word that is really Yiri, and that word Yiri means the one who sees. Wow. He sees what you have need of before you ask, yet he said ask. And then Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, and his banner is a banner of victory. That's what it is. Yes. The banners that were carried forth were always victory. And then Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd, I shall not want. That beautiful shepherd song. And we've heard those, but they're all comprehended in one name. The name above every name, the name of Jesus. And I just feel like there's somebody out there, Brent, we've got to pray for today. Yeah. We've I was got going to ask you that. Would you close us out? Would oh, I'd be delighted to. I want to pray for you that have a question in your mind whether or not you know Jesus. Say these words out loud. Lord Jesus, I call on your name. And you said in your word, if I would come and call on your name, I would be saved. Save them now, Lord. Lord, I believe for people to come from the north, south, east, and west, drawn to the real, drawn to the anointing of your spirit that will literally set down on locations and we will see great revivals through men and women of God. In Jesus' name, amen. What an honor. What a time. There's years more of shows and stories that you've got. But thank you for being thank you, with us today, my friend. Thank you. First of friend. many.